I am.
Hi, everybody. Hey, Jesse. Hi, Matthew. Good to see you. You too. How have you been? Great. Good, good. Did I'm going to try something. I have a handout, just a, a PDF handout, and I was going to see if I could drop that in the chat for everyone. That'll be cool. And then we will attach it to our meeting highlights. Exactly. Did that go through for you? I have it. Download it now. And I've got a lot of slides and a lot of photos. So hopefully people are ready for a whirlwind tour. I, I go just as fast presenting as I do walking. So Yay. did you make it through the storms okay? Mm -hmm. What about you? Good. My my property was fine. Um, my husband got a flat tire driving home in the storm. But oh boy. that was the worst that happened. Yeah. Not a day to have a flat tire. Nah, not the best. But he said the rain slowed down while he was changing it and picked up again once okay. he was done. So it was perfect. Oh, good. I think the way we'll do it, we'll go through um, our beginning portion. We have uh, like a couple shout outs and a thought of the month that we go over and some chapter business. And then I will introduce you and have you take it from there. And then after okay. you're done, uh, we usually do like an upcoming opportunities portion and any questions or discussion. Okay. And what time frame do you want for me? I have about an hour. Is that correct? That's perfect. That's yeah, perfect. I might go a little bit longer depending on how how things go with everybody, but yeah, we'll we'll take as much as we can get. You know, you're talking about okay. plant nerds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then um, I've got a couple of things I wanted to just the last two slides or last three slides are just upcoming stuff at Longwood. Great. We've got, a, we've got a really cool class that's coming up that's in person. Well, two, we have an invasive plants boot camp. And Ooh. the other one is an ecological restoration program where you actually get to plant trees at Longwood. Oh, that sounds really great. So, yeah, some cool stuff. Gotta get my last bit of stretching in before lecturing. Run around <laughs> your house a couple times. Yeah. I took the dogs for a walk right before this in the hopes that, one, we wouldn't hear them barking as much. And two, they wouldn't expect that when, you know, it's close to nine at night, but yeah. we'll see. Jesse, I'm trying to play around with this so that I can be reading, um, trying to figure out how to make my email more accessible um, while you're showing the slides, you know? So yeah, I was thinking about it, Audrey. Do you kind of think, do you want me to change the slides and you read with the slide change or do you want me to try and slide change it? <laughs> Yeah, I was hoping that I'd be able to see my notes and then read as you change them, but I don't think I can get them lining up here. That's what I'm trying to just tweak it so that, um, 
you know, I can see what you're doing uh, before I read it, but it doesn't look like that's going to work just because And I'm you not... read and I will just, well, I'll slide click and we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll make it work. You're awesome. Thank you. No problem. There's got to be a better way to, to do this um, so that I don't have to make you do any of it, but um, I will figure that out. I don't mind at all. You make it very simple for me, so don't feel bad at all. I'm so happy you do it, and all of our members benefit from it so much. It's not a problem. Thank you. Of course, Liam's cutting the lawn right now. I don't know if that's coming through, but. Nope, you sound clear as a bell, you're fine. Good. Not raining here. It's actually sunny right now. Yeah, the sun just peaked out for us also. And it hasn't really rained all day, just kind of spit every once in a while. Be great if one day there was no lawn to cut. <laughs> that is the goal. Yeah. Or pathways. I don't mind. I have uh, one of those, I forget what they're called now, like just the manual uh, no power mower, like the rotary old school. Blade. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that is my goal to only have to use that eventually. Cool. But I. I'm excited to say I've only cut my lawn six times this whole year. Nice. From um, April, I think was the first time until just like last week or two weeks ago, maybe I, I cut it for the sixth time. So uh, really, really pleased with that. Yeah. Of course, I have a much higher tolerance for tall grass and quote, unquote, weeds. <laughs> I, I think you're ahead of George, though. I think he's only cut it four or five times yeah. over here. That's exciting. I need to come over and see your new property. Well, we'll be planting things soon, and then there'll be something to see at the moment. There's, well, there's going to be too much grass for a long time. But yeah, the house itself is amazing, and we are going to have a party. But at this point, probably not until spring, but we'll be you know, having people over in dribs and drabs betwixt now and then just because we love the house, so. Well, I totally just invited myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fine. Just let us know when you want to come over and we'll go out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm kidding. Just let us know. Yeah, we're, we're here pretty much all the time, so. <laughs> Marilyn, you're here. How are you? Good. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I'm still in Maine. There you are. You're still in Maine? I am. Yeah. We're going back in a couple of weeks. Okay, good. Good, good. How is it? Pardon me? How is it? It's uh, right now it's cold and rainy, but it's been beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. It's been anyway. a very strange year. Oh, Very whereabouts strange. in Maine? Uh, Islesboro, which is off Camden. Yeah, you know, I was just there two days ago. No, come on. Uh, Islesboro yeah, or Maine? No, Maine. I was up in Hamden. Uh, driving, driving through Hamden. I was at Orono, uh, or Orono uh, Bog. You'll actually see a picture of it in here. Yeah, it, it's a great place to be, especially when it's hot in Pennsylvania. True. <laughs> It's not even that hot in Pennsylvania. Well, I looked at the weather today and it looked like you were having pretty nice weather it's or at least cooler weather. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be back soon. Awesome. <laughs> got lots of fun things coming up. Yep. I've missed a lot of stuff too. Well, we've missed you, but we will be glad when you can join us. Good. I will be happy too. We are going to give it just another minute or two, let people file in here, and then we will get started. Oh, speaking of, I should bring out my, my notes. <laughs> Audrey, I'm, I struggle with the same thing. Fortunately, I have my laptop and then my cell phone that I bring up the uh, presentation on. Good um, idea. Mm -hmm. 
but I almost forgot to do that part. So let me do that part. Um, well, I don't have my email on this cell phone. You know, like everything was on my other cell phone now that I didn't use it anymore. And then, so I don't have anything on the one that I'm using currently. Seventeen clicks, and I will get it. Oh, Audrey, you still have a cell phone uh, for me to call you on Monday about the order. Well, um, it's an extra one that my husband had laying around, so it's a different number. But I will um, email that to you. Okay, or wherever you want me to call you, house phone, cell phone, whatever works for you. Okay, thanks, Susan. Thanks for volunteering to do that. Yeah, I really sure. appreciate that. Sure, no worries. And Lindy's very thankful too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I agree. I did I did call her and ask and make sure that she was okay to do this and she was like, yeah, sure. So I'm very blessed to have lovely children. <laughs> That's really it. Yeah, Lindy's super sweet. The shit. Let's go. Somebody who um is irritated at her time is not muted. So hear me. We will get started. Thank you everyone for coming to our monthly Wild Ones meeting. We have had six new members since our last meeting. And we are getting new members every day from Facebook, from word of mouth from some of our great members who are telling their friends and their other organizations about us. In case you don't know who we are, let's see if I can make this smaller. Um, I'm Jesse, I'm the president. Audrey is our vice president. Susan is our secretary and webmaster. She takes care of our Facebook group and our website, thankfully. Um, our treasurer is Michelle, and Lindy is our membership chair who can't be with us tonight. Mother Marilyn is with us. Um, she advises us in all things. We have our YouTube channel. This meeting and every meeting um, in the future will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel, as long as we're meeting virtually. If we're out and live and in person, there will probably not be a recording. Jesse? You're not yeah. sharing your screen if you think you are. Um, no, I can see it. Yeah, I, yeah. All right. Well, I must have the wrong one. Sorry, I got it. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, we also have a Instagram that I know nothing about, but Lindy takes care of that. We have our own chapter website. Visit us there. Um, there had apparently been a link issue with our Facebook, maybe, and our chapter website, but that has been corrected. And um, the meeting recordings and a lot of the resources that we share in our meetings will also be on our website. Then um, give us a few days to catch up with that. This is just a, a visual of some of the places that our new members are coming from. And if you live in those areas, I'm hoping that our members can get together that live in the same areas and get some bigger projects in open spaces uh, in their towns or townships um, started by getting together. Our thought of the month this September is very timely and it is about seeds. So I'm going to share photos while Audrey gives our presentation on our thought of the month seeds. Thanks, Jesse. So as Jesse said this month, we're thinking about seeds. Though nature's getting ready for a well-deserved rest, she's also thinking ahead to next year and sowing seeds. So let's take a look at some of what's going on out in the garden. The fern fronds are heavily laden with spores. The cone flowers are nearly ready for the goldfinches. The milkweed pods are getting ready to burst.
The squirrels are awaiting the oak and hickory nuts and walnuts. The dogwoods take on new life with their beautiful red berries. Everywhere you look, there are seeds. I'm always amazed by nature's abundance. Seeds are so plentiful. I have enough elderberries from just three plants to start a cough syrup business. And Jesse was smart enough to put a little recipe up there in case anybody wants to make that elderberry syrup. Go ahead, Jesse. There we go, we weren't clicking there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The red bud seed pods resemble snow pea pods and are just as delicious to the critters that eat them. The hazelnuts will make welcome additions to our fall recipes. Here's a simple one to try with a vegan option. And this link will be on our website. So check out the seeds you have in your yard and take time to notice and appreciate nature's bounty and beauty. In December, we'll be talking at our monthly meeting about winter seed sowing. So now's a good time to start collecting seeds that you want to sow or share. There's plenty of advice on online about how to collect, dry, and store seeds. I found a simple one and a detailed one that we will share on our website. And remember, fall is a great time of year to plant. The soil is already warm and the air is cooler so there's less stress on the plants. You also have to water less frequently, generally speaking. Edge of the Woods Nursery says that almost all trees and shrubs can be planted right up until the ground freezes. They recommend planting perennials by around Halloween to give the plants time to root before heavy frosts. And I just wanted to end with this cute little video that my daughter shared with me recently about spreading native wildflower seeds. And we'll also have this link on our website if you want to see it again or share it. I am going to try and play this. planting wildflowers throughout our community for over 10 years now. We find neglected patches of land that have clearly not been tended, that have been forgotten about, and we sprinkle our seeds on those areas. One year for Christmas, I got her a Parmesan cheese shaker from Salvation Army, and I filled it with wildflower pollinator beneficial seeds. Native wildflowers are wildflowers that are either from your region or are a part of the ecosystem that contribute to the flora and fauna habitat. And they support the local native bees, butterflies, other pollinators. A lot of traditional gardening and garden design doesn't really incorporate these native wildflowers that are really critical to the health and well-being of the, the local pollinators. We started SF in Bloom as a place to share our knowledge and passion around plants and really democratize gardening and make it accessible to as many people as possible. Yeah, we showed them other things, you know, how to plant if you have only concrete or, you know, no light in your yard or all of these other things, how to do drip irrigation. And they like, like those videos, okay? But the videos that they go crazy about are the ones with the Parmesan cheese shaker and the native seeds, because I don't know, it's very accessible and it's a low bar to entry, it's affordable, anyone can do it, you can hand it to your kids. Pollinator insects are struggling due to pesticides, encroachment on their habitats, and erratic weather patterns due to climate change. I realized when you're walking around a city block, just like how few and far between both the food and the habitats are for these very important part of our communities, our beneficial insects.
one of our biggest questions is where can I find local seeds? And we get asked this question from people all around the world. So we put a ton of resources on our website and if people share resources they have, we'll add them. Basically, how to search if plants are native to your area or if they're invasive, what plants are beneficial to birds and, and local insects. Just want to be careful and do a little bit of homework when buying wildflower seeds to ensure that they're not just something labeled wildflowers that aren't really, and there's great tools out there you can do it really quickly to, to confirm that what you're getting is indeed you know, a local native wildflower for your region. The question we're asking is how can we promote planting beneficial wildflowers in our community and our governments and encouraging that? If there are any barriers, we can help change those and shape them because this is something that is, is beneficial and needed. The traditional way of gardening and lawns is just kind of devastating for local ecosystems. Join your HOA, join your committee meetings and help communicate to them why it's important. Yeah, help normalize land restoration yeah, in help, your community. <laughs> help, help normalize planting native wildflowers. Yeah. Wasn't that excellent? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, so let me get back to this. So, um, Audrey, that was- up to $40,000 of income from uh, veterans' yeah. retirement uh, from in I can make it be quiet. income taxes altogether. This, this is gonna be between 1,400 and Who knows what's gonna pop up here next? <laughs> Trying to stop. Okay. So um, on to our chapter business. We talked last month that we um, kind of adopted a Hillsdale Elementary School project and um, some of our members were kind enough to donate their time and their hard work into um, restoring a section of overgrown area that was um, full of invasives. I have an update with pictures for that next. Um, the, the chapter board authorized spending a significant portion of our money, mostly that came from your dues from joining Wild Ones to adopt this bed and fill it with native plants that goes along with a curriculum to teach the children native plants, how to plant things, why they're beneficial, and the teachers of that school can do a year-round program because of the things that are going to be going into that bed. Those plants arrive next week. That is very exciting. Um, we also had our first tabling event and we were sponsored by Hatrick Honey. We spent three days at the Ludwig's Corner Country Fair. Um, so I have some a couple pictures to share from that. And then we have another tabling event that's coming up on the 18th at the Green Earth Festival. This is the before picture of the Hillsdale, Hillsdale Elementary School. And these are the beautiful prepped beds that are ready for the plants that are gonna go in next week. Very exciting, beautiful work. That was not easy. Um, this was at the Ludwig's Corner Horse Show. This was our tabling event. We got a lot of interest. We collected over 30, I think 29 um, emails that got added to our distribution list. And hopefully some of those fine folks will decide that our chapter is where they want to make a difference. Um, hopefully some of them are at tonight's meeting but we got to answer a lot of questions about the plants that were in the vases, all of which were native plants. And as you might guess, the um, most questioned plant, I'm not sure if you can tell from the picture, but I have a uh, pokeweed or pokeberry there. And that was the plant that got the most questions. So I was very excited to share with people that they should really be leaving that beautiful plant as long as um, they don't have a little kid that's going to like eat it. Uh, but I did explain we have gotten here as a people because 
the majority of our parents and ancestors taught children not to randomly eat berries. So we've survived as a race and uh, they can too do that for their little kids. Um, we also have this opportunity. Our chapter needs to nominate board members for next year. Uh, I don't know, Susan, if anybody reached out to you. No one reached out to me about um, being on the board of officer nominees um, or the committee. So we will play it by ear. Um, I'm happy to stay on as president unless somebody wants to usurp or, you know, nominate somebody else. Um, we can discuss that. But tonight, everybody has joined us for this exciting opportunity to listen to um, our presentation by Matthew Ross. And Matthew is the educational director, the continuing education director at Longwood Gardens. And he's going to share stories from the swamps, bogs, and marshes where he spends his free time, apparently as recently as two days ago. Um, searching for plants that thrive in these conditions. So I am, Matthew, going to turn it over to you. Give me a second to figure out how to stop sharing my screen and let you share. That looks perfect. 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 Well, thanks, Jesse, and thanks, everybody. Uh, I know I got a chance to meet some of you. Um, on our trip through the Pine Barrens, you might actually see a couple images from that trip, uh, and I'll be headed back out there tomorrow. So uh, I'm going bog to bog to bog, and uh, glad to share this part of my experiences with all of you. I also wanted to mention I'm a national board member for Wild Ones, so I'm on the uh, national board. And for those of you that haven't enrolled yet, uh, we have an upcoming lecture on the Native Garden Designs of Boston that are part of the Native Garden Designs that we've been doing with help from Stanley Smith. And we also have another recently announced uh, lecture coming up with Heather Holm on wasps. So if you're interested, she's one of our honorary directors at the national level. So I talk relatively quickly. I walk relatively quickly. We're going to go through a huge amount of slides today. But if there's anything at any point where you want me to stop, slow down, or add any uh, additional insight, feel free to use the chat feature. I've got the chat box open on my screen. I also sent out a little handout. Uh, I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to see that. Um, just a PDF with some of the plant names of the plants that we're gonna cover today. Um, and as Jesse mentioned earlier, there will be the video recording for you to check out. So I hope to see you guys all at an upcoming event. But until uh, we do, let's uh, enjoy these, uh, this little presentation on plants that like soggy soils. So water in our society is spiritual. It's what keeps us alive. It's what most of our bodies are made out of. Are you all seeing this okay? Yes. Mm. And here we have one of the dams up in upstate New York uh, that provides the drinking water to residents just north of New York City. It's part of our daily lives. And for some of us that are fortunate enough to come out to Longwood Gardens, it's part of our entertainment and the joy in our lives, which I'll be at this show know? later tonight. Is my high chair here? Do you know? No. It... And it's also an artistic element. But it's the essence of our beings. And hopefully, like many of you, uh, uh, or like, like I get a chance to often, I hope many of you get a chance to experience uh, water in all forms of your lives. It also has a very symbolic meaning and for many people around the world is celebrated. And that is a spiritual bond at the land where human beings interface with the water's edge. So we'll talk a little bit today about some of the most amazing plants that you'll see growing at the water's edge. Uh, this one, since it's not white uh, and I know this particular cultivar, it is one that is cultivated uh, but we are going to look at some of the more natural plants as well. So while I'm at a garden that specializes in the most amazing water plants in the world from all around, including these gigantic Victorias, uh, we are going to focus today on our native plants. So when we think about a marginal plant or a plant that grows at the water's edge, what we talk about is 
Um, plants that are functional, they're aesthetically pleasing. Many of you might already have many of these plants in your own garden. But when we talk about a marginal plant, there's one species in particular. I'm going to see if you guys can identify what is the first plant when you think about a plant that thrives in the water's edge. What is the first plant? Feel free to either chime in or type it in the chat box. Cattails. Cattails, okay. What else? That's one, that's one of them that, that generally is thought of as being one that survives at the water's edge. Native. I got native and then a lot of garble, trout lily. Yeah, definitely one there. Loose rife. Loose rife. Yeah, not our, <laughs> yeah. not always our favorite plant. Uh, no. Iris. What else? Willow. Willow. Pickerel weed. Pickerel weed. Wow, you guys are great. You're already naming them. Cardinal flower. Cardinal flower. We're going right through a lot of the, uh, here we go, swamp hibiscus, pitcher plants, gun cabbage. These are all plants that we'll talk about today, many of which don't get their due credit in the, in the manicured landscape or the designed environment. But there's one plant when I used to teach at the collegiate level that I always used to be the example that embodies a marginal plant. Does anybody know what this one is? It's native just a little bit south of here. Zones eight, nine, 10. Cypress. Oh. That is a mangrove. And it, just as the mangrove handles brackish water, it also provides habitat for a myriad of different organisms from crabs to birds to snakes. It's providing habitat and actually building out or extending the land into the water. And while we might not have the opportunity to have mangroves in our own gardens, we're going to focus on some of the woody plants that also uh, will thrive at the water's edge. So why would we want to use these plants? Well, here is a picture of Philadelphia. And here is also a picture of Philadelphia uh, <laughs> recently during Hurricane Ida. So we know that this area is an area of dynamic weather patterns extreme environmental conditions. And by having these plants here, hopefully they help mitigate some of the challenges that we are experiencing during historic flooding. But it doesn't have to be at a grand scale. It could also be just an area in your garden where the water seems to sit or settle, like what we're seeing right here in a very urban environment, that these plants could help provide environmental services, habitat, and beauty. And hopefully stop eutroph eutrophication uh, or the proliferation of um, algal growth and bloom. So what are some of the benefits? Well, they have the ability to survive in harsh conditions, low oxygen environments. Some of us that live a little bit more coastal might be experiencing brackish or saline, wa or saline water. Uh, they can thrive in anaerobic conditions like many of you that went with us to the Pine Barrens in very waterlogged anaerobic conditions. And if you remember that smell, when we first got down to the water's edge along the Mullica River, uh, they can help survive in those conditions and be a beacon of beauty. They provide habitat and shelter for wildlife. And here at North Creek Nursery, many of you might have purchased plants as part of the uh, plant sale. This is one of their demonstration plots. If you've never had a chance to go there, if there's ever an opportunity, I highly recommend you get a chance to go out to North Creek. But here are some functional areas that are helping clean the water to make sure that any nursery runoff and any excess nutrients are trapped by these plants and used for the better good. And they could be in all different shapes, sizes. Some of them can be slightly more aggressive. Some could be a little bit less aggressive, but here this community is helping provide ecological services for the water coming off the nursery. You're also noticing up there, there was a little bit of rocks and that's a sediment trap. And for those of you that are looking at designing rain gardens or bio uh, filtration systems, it is important to make sure that you have a way of cleaning out your sediment. What are some of the other benefits? They help reduce the effects of stormwater, minimize the intensity of water in the landscape, excess water in the landscape. They prevent erosion. They can collect siltation like what we just saw or inorganics. And they can provide bioinfiltration by having their roots 
drag the water from above the surface down into the soil profile. They're aesthetically pleasing and they help ward off invasive vegetation. Earlier, Marilyn was talking about loose strife. Well, if you can outcompete it and you don't give it a chance and do that with native plants, it's much harder for it to establish and thrive. So at the very beginning, I asked what some of the plants are that you might be thinking about uh, that would be in this marginal community. And the good news is, is that you guys are brilliant. You already know many, many of them. Um, so here they are. Cattails, the very first plant that you guys uh, mentioned is the first one that we'll talk about. So cattails are often on that um, uh, list of plants that people either love or hate. But I encourage you to think about cattails a tad bit differently as also being a food source, not just for wildlife like this little snail right here, but also for you. Uh, they do have uh, edible attributes. Uh, I was just talking to a friend about eating cattail roots with my mom uh, not too long ago. Uh, they can provide beauty in many ways and can help stabilize uh, unstable areas and push out things like loose strife or potentially Phragmites australis. Then you mentioned cardinal flower. It's like you guys were here when I was putting this presentation together. So many of you know cardinal flowers, Lobelia cardinalis, a plant that can grow in more upland soils, but also it thrives when it's getting some soggier soils. So a beautiful plant, striking red color. How many of you, you feel free if you, if there's one, one or more of you that wanna raise your hand, if you grow this plant or uh, type in the chat, it's a stunning plant. It's a gateway into the native plant world. And here it is looking exceptionally spectacular during the Roberta Burley Marks designed display at New York Botanic Gardens Native Garden. Skunk cabbage. Wow, it's literally like you guys wrote this presentation. Um, skunk cabbage, here we go. Uh, one of the uh, unsung heroes of the wet areas. Many of you know this plant, but one thing you might not know about it is that it's thermogenic and it, it actually melts snow and it has big bowl leaves. You can eat it. I have eaten it. It's not great. Uh, I did native plant roll-ups uh, and um, it's a it's a uh, interesting flavor to put it lightly. Uh, how many varieties of smaller native cattails are there? I'd like some for my pond. Ellen, there are some great ones. If you're in our area, Maryland Aquatic um, is a awesome grower. I don't know uh, what their availability is or if they're wholesale only, but if you're in the, um, in the area uh, and want to see where they're selling their product, they have, they have some good stuff there too. And here we have skunk cabbage being the harbinger of spring, melting that snow and filling the forest floor early on with gigantic leaves. And I love uh, taking kids out and showing them skunk cabbage because it's one of the first things to pop out. It's got that fragrance that we all know and love as well as the fragrance that flies love and has a great story. An interesting thing about this plant is it has extremely long lived roots and can come back in the same area for over a hundred years. So it is a long lived perennial when many of our other perennials don't uh, necessarily stand the test of time, pun intended, or skunk cabbage can do that. Iris, another one that we mentioned. Donna, you mentioned this one earlier. There's one particular iris I just wanted to call out. I know it's a cultivar, but it is virus versicolor purple flame. It's a Mount Cuba introduction, super cool plant that they grow at North Creek that starts off in the very early spring by having dark purple bases to it. Um, a pretty interesting plant. It is a cultivar of a native plant, but it is one that adds a little bit more interest into uh, the garden in the early spring. By summertime, after it blooms, it's gonna be bright green and nice and lime and thrives on the edge of the water. Uh, it is one that can tolerate a little bit more drought than some of your others. So you can put it in an area that might be fluctuating um, and I've used Iris Versicolor many times in rain gardens. It does spread by its roots. Um, so it will kind of trickle into the different areas that you may want it to grow. It's also easy to divide this one and make friends. Um, Iris Versicolor straight species is one that's relatively prolific if it's in the right conditions. And one that if you wanna share with your native plant friends, by all means do so. This is a little bit of a shocker to many people, but Lotus is actually native from New Brunswick all the way down to Southern Texas. 
And while we might associate this plant with the Eastern religions that it is uh, highly uh, regarded in, it is one that is actually native to North America. Now, uh, lotus is one that can also be extremely aggressive. So you do wanna be careful of where you're planting it. And this does best in areas that have relatively mild movement at best, but not a lot of movement in the water, much like water lilies. They're gonna thrive in those conditions where there's water moving through the system, but not rapidly moving through. Um, here are some beautiful ones at Grounds for Sculpture out in New Jersey, and they can spread prolifically. It's also one of the only plants that you see birth, life, and the afterlife all together as one, and was the impetus for floral design uh, as early as 600 years ago uh, as being the three elements of Ikebana in Japan. There's a red twig dogwood, a very common staple, one that's used often in rain gardens, but also has its place in your regular landscape. Cornicericea, or some of you might have already started using the new name, Sawai, uh, which is the new name for Cornus, for all of you that are not as corny as I am, I'm still using Cornus because it's fun to say and there's a lot of different puns you can do with it. Uh, there, but in addition to the red twig, there's also the beautiful and striking yellow twig, which I encourage you to think about using in your landscape, just to add a little bit of diversity of color. Now, willow gets a bad rap. Willows are another one that we mentioned earlier. Um, there are um, a whole lot of willows out there. I've had the pleasure of being out in the Vermont Willow Company that you see right here with that beautiful Vermont rolling hills landscape behind it in peak fall color. Uh, there were 480 selections of willow, many of which were native, some of them were not, that have anything from orange stems to yellow stems to black stems to pussy willow flowers to hanging um, catkins. So there's a big diversity in willow and oftentimes it gets a bad name, a bad rap saying that it's gonna destroy your leach field. It's going to rip up your, your foundation of your home. It's gonna knock out your sidewalks. But when planted appropriately, willows, especially if they're coppiced or cut back to the base every year can provide a lot of staking material that provides habitat for natural um, stakes in your garden. So you're less reliant on plastic and metal. And they also are home to a wide assortment of insects, uh, both those that are predatory and those that might be beneficial for having them in the garden. So a fun plant, I, I kind of view it after that hierarchy of oaks and cherries under Doug Tellamy's work. I think willow's not far behind in terms of providing services for insects. And you can find them, they will find this for sure. Oftentimes you'll see galls or other um, insect habitat and insect feeding on most of your willows. Um, there's river birch, very common plant, one that you see in the landscape a lot. Here it is at Lum's Pond down in Delaware, if you guys have ever gotten a chance to go there. A really beautiful little pond not far away um, from where I'm at here at Longwood Gardens. They recently had a tornado go through there a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago. And sadly, this tree is no longer there, uh, but it's offspring are because the main trunk went down and some side shoots popped and it became a mother to many other trees. Um, some of the more unusual selections at the water's edge are things like marsh marigold. Now marsh marigold looks a lot like celandine um, or lesser celandine, which is not a great plant for us. It's kind of quite voracious and one that thrives on the edge of wet areas or areas that have been stripped of vegetation, where marsh marigold is a little bit more um, persistent uh, when it is at the edge of an area, not necessarily on a steep embankment. It uh, plays well with others. Here it is with Arontium and many other water loving plants. It provides a, a shot of yellow. Um, and then after it blooms earlier on in the season, occasionally you get some blooms uh, into the late summer. Um, that are kind of sporadic on this plant. Grows relatively uh, slowly at first. So if you're looking at planting this in a water's edge, you might want to have several specimens go in at first to make a mass rather than just plucking in one plant that might not thrive in that condition. And it's a fun one to mix in with things like Saracenias uh, that you see here at Mount Cuba Center. 
hibiscus. So hibiscus, we almost always assume that there's a tropical plant and it's coming uh, to you to bring joy and this tropical flavor, but we do have a lot of native hibiscus as well. This is one that's actually indigenous down in Texas, but there are several of them that we have here, mainly hibiscus mosquitoes, um, which is our swamp hibiscus. How many of you have seen swamp hibiscus in full bloom? Absolutely stunning plant. There's not many of them that get that big out of our herbaceous native flora. And if you want to utilize that in your landscape, just know that it takes a long time for this plant to emerge from the soil. So if you haven't seen a whole lot of activity early on in the season, don't fret. It is one that typically takes a little bit longer to grow. And my design tip would be to plant something that would have spring interest right nearby so that you would have it then emerge past that spring plant. And then in the winter, you will see its seeds. If you drive anywhere in this area near a wetland, you're almost bound to find it. Um, there's an amazing patch of it that was just in bloom not too long ago uh, near Bordenton, New Jersey, or Bordenton, um, uh, uh, Pennsylvania on the uh, Bucks County, New Jersey, like the Burlington County um, uh, interface right along the, the Jersey Turnpike. So a beautiful patch out there that's just massive. Also, if you go out to the Heinz Park, right near the airport, there is a ton of hibiscus there too. So if you've never seen it in full bloom, especially in its natural environment, it's a showstopper. Here's one that you don't normally associate with being a wet loving plant, but I can definitely guarantee that this thing does well in areas of great fluctuation in water. And that is the larger giant cone flower, not necessarily native to exactly where we're at. So you do have to uh, want you, you'd have to find out if this is one, I don't know how broad our distribution is in terms of people that are on the call, but it might be one to think about um, if you're looking to make a massive impact. It is a humongous plant, can get seven to eight feet tall, blue foliage, yellow flowers, and anytime a plant is taller than a human being, it's a showstopper for kids. So definitely one to think about. Um, great selection of this at North Creek that was right in that, um, that rain garden facility uh, that they have, and it was growing rapidly. So it does do well in um, some more wet situations. And here it is uh, in a landscape. You can see it's quite large here. And just like this woman is wondering, what the heck is that giant thing popping out of the ground? I'm sure it would be a showstopper for your neighbors, your friends, uh, if you had this in your landscape. For those of you that went with us to the Pine Barrens on that fun trip that we had earlier this year, this is the one that we were looking for when I got down in that mucky anaerobic situation. This is the Golden Club or Orontium aquaticum. Now this plant is in the Araceae family, which means that it typically has a spathe and spadix. And here it is a naked flower without the, the spathe. Um, and a really great plant if you're into having tadpoles or frogs, because as it lays its foliage on the surface of the water, it provides some cover so that birds and other animals that might be looking to eat or pick off those little polywogs uh, might not be able to see them as it provides kind of a nursery for young amphibians and also young fish. So um, I know someone said earlier um, that they were having a pond. So Ellen, if you're looking for a fun plant for your pond and you're into amphibians, this is a great one for you. They do well in anaerobic situations. So areas that are quite swampy and water doesn't necessarily move through all that well. Um, and it seems like Shannon's excited because hibiscus is one of her favorite and coolest plants in her garden. This is also one that's got a lot of potential. Earlier, I can't remember who it was that said it, but pickerel weed, Pontedaria cordata, really cool plant. Um, this one has- That was me. That was you? Thank you very much. Uh, very cool plant. It's one that there is a interesting bee uh, that is part of its pollination process, but it is a generalist. It'll bring in a lot of your different pollinators. And if you continuously cut the flowers back after they kind of set seed or get ready to set seed, if you prevent that from happening, Oftentimes you'll get in another bloom off the plant. I've used it in floral design. It's a lot of fun to use in floral design as well. 
and um, a big showstopper. Now this one likes to have its feet wet almost all the time. So this would be one that you'd plant a little bit further in in a wet, soggy soil. And here you can see just some of the beautiful patterns on its leaves. They're typically green, but you also get a little bit of yellow in there every once in a while or some striated patterns. There are some selections of this plant that have that in full force, but I love that purple color and catching a bee on one of these first thing in the morning is one of the most beautiful things here at the ponds at Longwood Gardens. It's hard not to fall in love with a plant that looks this beautiful. These are Saracenias. Um, they are native to the United States. It freaks people out every time they see these, right? How many people have ever tried to grow them themselves? They can be grown. They do a little bit better in pots or if you create a man-made man, uh, uh, man or, or a, a non-natural, uh, uh, an engineered bog. So they do work out well with peat and sand together in relatively lean soils because they're going to eat their food for you. So you don't want to fertilize these as you would most of your other plants because they're eating their own fertilization. So here they are in the winter. Uh, this is a, in DC with that beautiful stained glass window uh, lip. And the one that's most prolific in our area is uh, Saracenia purpurea. And it goes as far north as where Maryland is joining us from. This is up in Northern Maine, just north of Bangor. And the environment that you had not expected in, this is actually a bog with all the evergreens around here. And every little splash of red that you see is actually a Saracenia. That's a Rono bog, which is uh, operated by University of Maine. And it's a floating bog platform. Put this on your botanical bucket list if you've never been. Um, really cool place. And I'm seeing Maryland light up. Is this a place that you might go and try to hike to? I think you should. You'll have to tell us all about it. So we've talked a lot about herbaceous plants, but there's also another real large palette of woody plants that thrive in these conditions that are often overlooked. And I think of button bush as one of those stalwart plants when I'm doing landscaping. I can attest to the fact that this is one of the toughest plants that's out there. Uh, I planted it in Toledo many, many years ago in an urban environment, extreme heat, um, lots of runoff from the road. And also uh, we had a mower two weeks after we planted it, run it over the shrub, chop it down to the ground, and it came back better than ever. So um, Cephalanthus occidentalis is one that's really, really tough. It can tolerate extreme wet, relative dry, fluctuations in between, and has a beautiful attribute with both the flower, the fruit afterwards, and its fall color. So I have no idea how this is not one of the most popular plants in the landscape trade, but it's a plant that just about every experience that I've had with it has been positive and it's been able to survive, if not thrive, in a myriad of different conditions. I like this one right here. This is from J and J, out in the um, uh, near where um, uh, Wild Ones is centered in Nina, Wisconsin. This is a little bit further down in Wisconsin, and they have one right here, really showing off that red coloration in those spiky balls. It's also one that's good for those of you that teach plant ID because it's world leaf arrangement, and these fruit clusters, kids think they're super cool. Um, if you've ever been to the Air and Space Museum, they have a section on their garden that is related to space-related plants, and they have button bush Sputnik in their collection. <laughs> we oftentimes think of red twig dogwood, and we forget some of our other native dogwoods, like Cornus ammonum, uh, the silky dogwood. Now, blue is a tough color to get into the landscape, Oftentimes it's one that we have to look outside of our native palette to find. And even then it can be a limiting color in the landscape beyond things like blue lobelia. Uh, so here we have a shrub that gets anywhere from six to 10 feet tall, typically uh, the silky dogwood. It's one that has beautiful blueberries. And here's one up in Maine just two days ago. Uh, and on my friend's property. And they had no idea that they had silky dogwood on their property. It has a wide distribution in the United States um, and is a really easy plant to grow. It will spread. So I'm just letting you know, if you do plant this, it's not as aggressive as gray dogwood, which I wouldn't recommend planting in these 
conditions, but it is one that will spread uh, a little bit. Speaking of spreader, uh, and Maryland works in drier areas, yes, it can. The, the Cornus uh, ammonum can do all right in some of the more upland areas. Um, if you get, make sure it's not totally dry. I don't know if it's edible. I love those berries. They look so cute. I would have to look into that. Um, I don't know if that is one that is edible. Speaking of spreading, this is a plant that has a, a love-hate relationship with most people that have them on their properties. But within the alders, there is a lot of opportunity um, to have live stakes, to have plants that are going to spread and create a thicket to prevent things like ramness or buckthorn from taking hold. Um, they are one that does create a massive tangled mess of uh, branches. But if you coppice them or cut them back every year and then use these branches in your floral arrangements and your seasonal um, arrangements at your home, it's a great way to bring a native woody plant into um, your seasonal displays. Now, elderberries, you mentioned them earlier, three shrubs starting a cough syrup business. That sounds like a, a book or a title in itself or maybe a short story. Uh, and I'd love to know more about how that's going for you, but elderberries are one of the most prolific flowering and fruiting native plants. They thrive in these conditions with soggy soils and they do well even if you have a spot in your landscape that might be getting excess water. I really think highly of them as a landscape plant. Now they might not shear up the way that some people wanna have balls of lilacs in their front yard, but it is a plant that provides great ecological services. It also is edible, so you can make um, fritters out of the flowers. You can um, boil down the berries into syrups and into alcoholic beverages if you're into that or mixers. Um, and it's not just food for us, it's also food for our smaller friends, our birds, and many other plants. One thing about the, the elderberry is that it is relatively quick to root, but if you take the live stakes and use them to make like a native plant wattle, like what they do in um, some botanic gardens down in the south, like North Carolina Botanical, they actually create structures out of them or fencing out of them during the winter months to provide some interest in the landscape and they're also the perfect food for solitary bees. They love that hollow pucky pith in the middle of the stem that looks like a salted pretzel. Um, really cool plant. And a metal fork makes it easy to scrape the berries off. Definitely. Thanks for the advice, Zach. Now this one is not necessarily native to our area. Um, it is one that um, I have seen in New Jersey. I've seen uh, as far south as Florida, and I've seen it even further north of here. I don't know if it's hyper local, but it is a really, really interesting plant. It's one that carries fall color well into the winter um, and is also one that uh, has good stem coloration. So I like this plant because I view it as four seasons of interest. It's got flowers in the summer. It's got um, really interesting uh, foliage that turns to an orangey red in the fall and can hold as late as December for all of us. And then when it first emerges and breaks bud, it's got some interest there as well. But here's that fall color at Longwood Gardens. The picture before is down in Florida where it doesn't get nearly as much light. But here with good light and good fertility, this is a plant that's got stunning fall color that could be a replacement for things like burning bush. It does sucker. So it will sucker off and kind of do its own thing. So give it a little bit of space, give it a little bit of love and make sure that you're um, cutting it back to encourage new growth to keep that red stem color. Spice bush, it's all over, it's all around us and we take it for granted. So it's a really interesting plant. It's fun if you're doing plant ID with kids or, or gardening with children to scratch that stem and get that fragrance. Um, you can also eat the berries. Um, you can crush out that outer coating. Um, there's a company in Ohio that actually does dusts cupcakes with them to add a little bit of spice on their cupcakes and buttercream frosting. So if you're uh, like me and you're still kind of hungry, uh, that could be an interesting uh, a touch of uh, your own landscape. Now it does survive in wet conditions and is one that we oftentimes, when we have wet areas, we don't think of woody plants or shrubs being the answer, but it does best as an understory and we'll do all right if it's not in direct sun all day long. 
Sorry about that. Uh, here are some of the ripe berries, uh, the red ones, not the green ones. Right, they're relatively small. They don't always pop up and they are a good food source for others as well. Sparkleberry is one that also has red berries. If you're in the world of deciduous hollies, you probably know this beautiful native plant. You might have seen it in the landscape and not known that it, if you see it in the wild, it's normally um, in lighter soils that have water nearby or will sometimes be flooded. So um, it's a really interesting plant. It goes all the way up again into the northern part of New England and then all the way over to my home state of Michigan. I love this plant because I had one of my best days fishing when this was in full uh, berry. And I still remember that day very fondly um, watching those berries be eaten by birds. Now you're probably wondering, here I am with my buddy John and he said, what is this plant? Here we are in Northern New York. There's a plant growing out of a rock, right? Does anybody know what this plant might be? The native woody plant. And surprisingly where this plant grows, many of you saw this when we were in the Pine Barrens trip, it can tolerate some abuse. It's becoming a more popular landscape plant, but it's one that you don't always associate with the water's edge. Here's the fruit cluster. Does anybody know yet? Nope. Let's see. This is Clethra. Oh. So Clethra all in the folia provides summer interest with sweet smelling flowers that just bloomed. Here's some uh, that are just wrapping up. This is from two weeks ago out of Franklin Park Reserve in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. Uh, and if you could have audio associated with a picture, you would be deaf because those, my friends, are bees covering this entire plant, buzzing their brains out at sunset getting all that last bit of pollen and nectar from this plant. It is a great pollinator plant and one that surprisingly does well in wet conditions. We'll talk a little bit about um, what you wanna do if you're preparing this. If it was grown in a traditional potting mix, you'll probably wanna wash some of the soil off and then bare root it into your area so that it doesn't rot. Uh, if you have a very light and, and very much a peaty soil mix, and you plant this in wet areas, it's gonna soak up all that moisture where this one likes to be in kind of a rockier, gravelier area when it's um, in the uh, natural environment. Now the, 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 the bald cypress further, or furthest most Northern range is at a place called Trap Pond in Delaware. So it is not technically native to Pennsylvania. However, it does extremely well in our environment and is one that as we look at projections of plant movement as climate change continues, it is a Southern species with the potential to move further North. So if you wanna get a jump start in the next couple decades and wanna plant a bald cypress, it is one that will survive and thrive in our area. It is one that can handle some really low oxygen situations like here in the Everglades. Um, and is a fun one to look for a taller woody plant or a canopy. How's everybody doing? We all having fun? Yep. Learning a lot tonight? You bet. Awesome. And I heard Clethra is a classic Maine shrub in seaside towns because it's cold hardy and doesn't mind windy, windy conditions. And if they can survive in those conditions, I'm giving a talk for the Smithsonian coming up in a couple, couple months on why it's important to go out and see these plants in the wild and really, I never thought of Clethra until that moment as being a plant that would have ever survived in this condition. But then knowing that and knowing that they can survive in these really harsh conditions by seeing them in the wild makes them more useful for me as a landscape designer to put them in troubled spots like soggy soils. So now we're moving to the really obscure. Here I am in Northern uh, Michigan. We've got our swamp rose, we've got our cattails, a bunch of sedges, which I'm sad, I'm sad I didn't include, but that's a lecture in itself. We've got some Mirica or Morelia or Bayberry here and alders and birches in the background. But there's a plant that's snug mixed up into this sedge community called the burr reed or Spargamium uricarpum. Uh, really interesting plant. Has anybody ever seen this before? It looks like a medieval torture device, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, it, it gets uh, a nice 
interesting uh, bit of fruit. The flower is somewhat insignificant. It's like white fuzzy balls. If you're in a macro photography, it's a phenomenal plant. Amen. If you're into like walking by and seeing plants in bloom, you could walk by this a million times and never notice it's flowering. Is so that it's an interesting plant? Yes. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Is that also, I mean, it looks a lot like Rattlesnake Master. Looks a lot like Rattlesnake Master. It's not a, it's not a, a, a ringium uh, or Rattlesnake Master, but Rattlesnake Master does do well in periodic wet conditions. Not as great if it's standing water, like the burr reed. This plant really does well if it's in that mucky standing water situation. It's not going to be as great as an upland plant or one that you have on the high side of a rain garden, but one that would do well like in the lower basin if you had a bioretention area or a soggy spot in your garden. This is another one that if you're in a macro photography, if you don't know I'm a photographer, most of these images are mine except for the, the one that was in um, Philadelphia with the flooding. Um, this plant is one that I'm like, can't get enough of it. It's Ludwigia alternifolia or seed box. And if you remember, we did find this on the Mullica River when we were down in New Jersey. Uh, for those of you that got a chance to go on that trip. And what's interesting about this plant is that the flower here in this picture looks stellar, but it's another one that's extremely, extremely small. It is not a show-stopping flower like a gigantic hibiscus. However, if you take the time to look at this plant, you'll notice that right behind that yellow flower is the beginnings of what I call its main aesthetic feature. And that is a stalk full of boxed jewels, like this one right here, that your native bees and native pollinators view as a great home for the winter. The other thing that's interesting about this plant is that right as it starts creating this box, it will also have its stems and leaves turn red. So if you have a wetland area and you wanna have a fiery explosion in the fall, this is a really interesting plant to mix into that area. I have friends that uh, at their home have planted in their ditches so that they're, you know, the front culvert, for those of you that have that type of situation, they just threw in seed and they've noticed that it's been a really fun thing for them in the fall to see those red stems and red, red leaves pop up against things like cattails and other sedges and um, interesting textural plants. This is my dream. Someday I hope to see a swamp pink in the wild. This is Helonius bolata. They are endangered. So I'm sharing with you a plant that I hope that there is hope for its future because I really want to see it in the wild. It's stunning. Uh, there are some Helonius bolata that are in the trade in terms of uh, they are plants that are easy to grow, which is surprising for an endangered species. It's just that their habitat is one that's in extreme peril. Uh, really phenomenal plant. Uh, it's one that the pink color uh, of the petals and that light dusty blue of its flower parts are absolutely show stopping. They only get about, uh, I don't know, three or four inches uh, uh, in terms of this inflorescence. This is highly magnified, but it is a show stopping plant. It's one of those that I encourage you to appreciate and view at Mount Cuba um, if you get a chance to go there when it's blooming uh, in the late spring. Um, similarly, if you want that same color in your garden, a plant that I have found to be very easy to grow is the Calipogon or grass pink orchid. So if you're into orchids and you have a bog, preferably a manufactured bog because this is one that likes drainage, so sand and peat together. Um, but if you have really lean soils, it does well there too. Where it doesn't do great is if you baby this plant and put it into really beautiful soil that you'd want to grow your veggies in, it doesn't like that, that condition nearly as much. They're fun to find in the wild, and they are one that I think has a lot of merit in um, either container gardens or small-scale manufactured um, bogs. It's also another orchid, uh, Sporanthes odorata Chadsford, named for Chadsford, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the Lady Tresses orchid. If you know Sporanthes, you know that many of them are only about the size of five or six inches, typically your cell phone or smaller, but this one can get 12 and 14 feet, or 12 and 14 inches, sorry, not feet, uh, in height. 
uh, and it has a uh, fragrance. So if you get a chance to get real close to this flower, uh, you can pick up on a little bit of that fragrance and it does very well on the edge of ponds or um, pools or streams. Uh, it can also be containerized and grown that way, but I really like the striking white flowers. They uh, typically bloom right about now. Uh, so it's also a late season orchid, a late season bloom. Bladder nut or Stephila or uh, Pinata. This is a very interesting plant. I first fell in love with it when I was teaching plant materials courses at Michigan State University. Uh, and it's because of this little bladder. And it will eventually become like a little nature, nature maraca because it has little seeds. And if you shake it really fast, you can hear it kind of wiggle. And if you get windy situations, you can sometimes hear that beating of the seeds going up against the pot itself. This is a plant that I, I know has a lot of uh, significance as a understory plant along rivers and streams um, and is one that just about nobody grows in the landscape, but those that do know that this is a very easy plant to grow, one that you can cut back and get new growth off of or let it get taller and get to be like 10 or 12 feet tall as an understory woody plant, which is oftentimes where you see things like buckthorn and honeysuckle thrive. So try to outcompete them with things like bladder nut. It's not incredibly fast growing, but if you plant a lot of them uh, and you try to have them have their seedlings emerge as you're fighting some of those invasive plants, it can help diversify and hopefully overcome uh, those areas. So a couple design tips. Uh, when you're looking at designing your uh, soggy area, the first thing you have to think about is designing your intent. What do you want this garden to look like? Is it something that's going to be formal, something that's going to be informal? Um, I tend to plant based on function and aesthetics rather than making the choice between the two. So if I'm given a plant opportunity, planting opportunity, I don't just look at it from a functional standpoint, which Sometimes you fall victim to where it's like, this is a plant that does well in this area. I just need it for function. I just need it to be green. Um, I try to look at the aesthetics um, of the plant as well. If you're creating a structured wetland or rain garden, you need to determine the capacity. Here you can see one that obviously went over its banks. Um, this was a uh, uh, planting in, in Canada that sadly got ripped uh, apart during a massive flood. You need a game plan for overflow. Uh, and you need to know the source of your water or irrigation. So it's really important, and I'll share another tip here in a second, to know where your water is coming from. What type of water you have on your property could be different from one situation to another. It might be saline, it might be coming off the road, or it might be um, a natural spring. All of those are going to have different properties, and all of those surprisingly could have different plant mixes um, associated with them because of things like saline water. Um, if you have issues with salinity or if you have instances of heavy salt, I highly recommend you go out to the salt marshes someday, hike around, um, especially around like Delaware, Maryland. There's some really good areas and you'll find things like American sweet gum there, which I never knew was really as tolerant as it is, which means that it might be a better street tree if you have an area where you're getting salt spray onto your plants. You have to look at properly laying your plant material. We talked about skunk cabbage um, earlier being that spring uh, flush of foliage, but then by the end of the year, uh, a lot of them will die off or will become more ephemeral. And in those situations, you'd wanna have something there in the fall and or winter to help stabilize the soil around it. You wanna fill the gaps with plugs or seeds. And I see that we already have a seed box conversation going on, which is great. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited that everybody likes this plant. It's, it's super cool, relatively insignificant 90% of the time, but when you do see it and it's in color, absolutely fantastic. Um, and that's a fun one you can overseed in areas with because it's gonna emerge. You might not know it as much, but it adds to that layer. I plan for plant migration. And what I mean by that is not every plant that I put right in the spot that I want it to be will remain in that spot forever. Seed box is a great example. I plugged a whole bunch of them out. Um, when I was in Ohio, we had about 100,000 plugs of native plants that we collected for a five acre property uh, that we were working on creating 
rain gardens for. We were in charge of all on-site uh, stormwater and we planted a bunch of seed box. And the next year we didn't see it at all. The next year we didn't see it at all. And then the third year it was like popping up all over the place. And it was all in different spots, spots that we didn't really think it would be in. So you do wanna plan for some of those plants to go a little bit wild and outside of the bounds of where we want them to be. I'd always joke and say that plants are in the business of surviving with or without us. So we can kill them with kindness or we could pamper them or we could want them and to confine them into one area and they're gonna do what they're gonna do. Um, it's important to uh, establish your plants. You wanna avoid any risk to nearby estuaries. So I talked a lot about plants on the edge of streams. It is also important to know what is downstream and to make sure that you're not disrupting a sensitive area. So oftentimes uh, you'll hear about people that um, go into an area and they clear it out and then they put in new plant material. Um, you have to be very sensitive to what type of wetlands you might be dealing with as well. And it's very important to stop invasive species right away. So if you start to see some other things popping up in those areas like loose strife or phragmites, it's important to nip that in the butt right away. So knowing your inputs, it's very important. Not all water is created equal. Uh, so here we have a nice little geyser at Innisfree, but it is very important to know where is your water coming from? How much of it you're gonna get? Are you uh, planning next to the base of the largest waterfall uh, volume like Niagara Falls? Or are you looking at something that also looks like Niagara Falls? This is an urban environment in that same area I was talking about in Ohio before I came out to Pennsylvania. We actually ended up putting a rain garden all along down what used to be a street and it now never floods the way that it had before. So using plants, using infrastructure can be a very important thing, but also knowing that this is street runoff and it's gonna have oils and it's gonna have other uh, chemicals in it is very important, especially when you're designing something that would be edible. Um, so um, ideally we never wanna see this. Uh, it's also important to know where your water goes afterwards. And that's something that not a lot of people do, but you can do just like a soil test, you can do a water test, a water quality test. And you can do that both in incoming water and outcoming water, and then show the impact of what your garden is doing. So it's important when, you, when you're creating uh, job, you know, public jobs, or if you're doing something in the, in the community, it shows the impact of what your planning is doing by testing your inputs and outputs. So ideally you want it to be as pristine as what you see here at Mount Cuba. And you don't need a specialized lab to do this. You can just send this away um, as well. Matching your soils. So if you have sandy soils and you are planting something that was grown commercially in a peat-based or a uh, very light um, soil mix, it's important to either wash off that soil and work it right into the sand, uh, which might make it a little bit more lean. It might not do very well at first, but matching your soils is really important. Are you in something like a marl situation or high levels of organic matter that are gonna be sitting on the surface of the soil? Uh, it's important for you to try to connect them as best you can, especially when you're dealing with moving uh, soil hydrology. So one of the things we do at Longwood is we actually mix in a lot of grit. Well, this is our natural uh, uh, topsoil here, our Chester County clay, which is extremely, extremely uh, high levels of clay in the soil. So you've got a lot of cation exchange capacity and also a lot of water holding capacity. So we mix that in with grit for a lot of our aquatic mixes, as you can see right here. So it keeps it a little bit lighter, fluffier um, for some of our plants that might not necessarily thrive in thick saturated clay soils. It's important to know about sensible plant selection. You guys already know all this. You could write a book on it. Um, this is making sure that you're finding function in the landscape and sourcing your plants native, from, from native sources. So rather than look at things like this beautiful stand that most people drive by and are like, oh my God, isn't this pastoral and amazing? And I think we know better. Um, you wanna make sure that you've got a clean quality source that doesn't have weed seeds or potential roots of other plants. And ideally you don't ever wanna see this. This is what happens with your um, refuge from wetlands uh, communities. This is water lettuce and water hyacinth invading Florida. So, um, you know, these are things that were in people's ponds that escaped. Um, so it's important to know why we don't wanna have those 
in our estuaries. Uh, I oftentimes look back to my, my roots back in Michigan and the herbarium there is absolutely fantastic because it provides this factor right here, which is a wetness factor. So it's got upland facultative, facultative wetlands, obligates um, to it as well. And it'll actually tell you, and I know we're not in Michigan, I know we're in Pennsylvania, but what's really cool about their herbarium is that it actually tells you what type of wetland the plant is native to. Now, a lot of the plants that are native there are also native here. So if you ever wanna know what type of wetland certain plants would be in, you can search their herbarium at University of Michigan, which kills me to say, because I'm a Michigan State grad, so go green, but for looking up uh, wetland speciation, they have a really good herbarium. So they have interesting keys on their page um, for you to take a look at. They look at like facultative upland plants, upland plants, and if you're ever in a situation where you're doing this as part of your career, it is very important to show people what type of wetland situations these plants are mostly in. That work was done by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and here are just some of their um, definitions from a paper that was published in 2012. The real last thing, and I know some of you are probably getting anxious because it's late into the evening and I've been talking about a bunch of edible plants, but I encourage you to think about things in a community. So if you're looking at recreating nature or trying to have your um, paintbrush of living plants, create a palette that's similar or functional to what you'd see in the wild, it's important to know where some of these plants are from. Are they from banks of rivers and streams, shorelines and beaches, wetlands, floodlands, uh, or pockets of saturated soil? So if you're looking for an area to design that might, near, might be near a riverbank or stream, I encourage you to walk by your, your local rivers and streams to see what's growing there. Or if you're out and happen to have a place out by the shore, see what the native plant palette has in store. You might also wanna look into floodplains. These are areas that have fluctuating water as well. So if it's fluctuating often, that oftentimes gives you plants that are a little bit more versatile in the landscape. Maybe you're interested in going and viewing swamps, which are wetlands that are described by having a predominance of woody vegetation in them. And you might see those beautiful knees popping out of the water. If you're looking at marshes, you'll notice there's a, a, a lot less woody plant material in them. Um, and you're seeing an abundance of herbaceous plant material. So uh, if you're trying to emulate those, they typically uh, don't have as many woody plants, but they also show a lot of resilience. Here I am in a salt marsh in Delaware, about 50 yards offshore. And you'll see that they can tolerate extreme changes in tidal uh, movement. And those type of plants can handle salt. They can handle it being drier. They can typically handle it um, next to uh, the built environment. Um, so there's some interesting plants in there, things like Spartina or cord grass uh, is a dominant plant as well as many of your sedges. And then bogs are areas that have real high humic uh, uh, content and they can oftentimes be extremely lean as well. Um, here we have a bog in Northern Ohio where you're seeing colic root and some cool um, drosera all in an area that used to be a pig farm that they scraped the surface of the soil off of to make it lean. So if I was trying to grow these same plants in extremely rich soils, most of them would probably rot out um, as well. So make some considerations for wildlife, thinking about birds. Here we are in Niagara near the falls where they actually just took all their ash trees and put them in the ground or uh, put them into the river in certain areas to create nurseries for fish. Uh, creating logs and areas for wildlife to get out of your wetland areas or your ponds, or creating embankments off the side that might hold water for some other little things, including at the meadow at Longwood, where it's kind of surprising that we have a little stream going right through the center of the meadow that is home to fish. So pretty cool um, to see that as well. So I mentioned that Arontium providing the perfect habitat for tadpoles, so definitely keep that in mind and make sure you take time to learn from others. In our area, we have grounds for sculpture that has incorporated native plants in a very artistic and formulaic garden 
that you see right here near Rat's Restaurant where you can stop by and get a good meal too. Or maybe you travel overseas to Dublin, Ireland and to a beautiful um, set of wetland ponds or go out to Toronto after you visit the falls and see a reclaimed uh, post-industrial site that utilize native plants to help filter out and be part of their master plan. Similarly at Brooklyn Bridge Park, you'll see that same Spartina or cord grass right here, all along the tidal basins of the rivers of New York. And you can see there is the Statue of Liberty right nearby. Or maybe you're visiting Maryland and friends up in Maine and want to see Coastal Maine Botanical, you see a good mix of native and non-native plants populating large ponds like you see at the entrance or filling the children's garden with Joe Pieweed coneflower and living uh, roofs like you see right here. Or going to a, a, a far underappreciated resource at Kenilworth National Park, a national park dedicated to lotus and water lilies. So if you get a chance to go there, that was just this summer uh, during their uh, Lotus uh, Festival. It's one of the greatest concentrations of Lotus anywhere you could imagine. Um, that's in uh, just outside of DC. Or if you're coming here to Longwood Gardens to see our beautiful meadow with a stream that you don't see, which is kind of hidden by the vegetation here, I encourage you to learn from others. And speaking of learning, we have a couple classes coming up that you might be interested in. We have Living a Lasting, Leaving a Lasting Legacy on November 3rd, which is a online class. And November 6th is an on-site class. We will actually be planting trees that will become part of, the, part of our permanent collection at Longwood Gardens. You get a chance to work side by side with our team that does monitor, plant, and maintain our meadows and natural areas. Should be a whole lot of fun. We also have an invasive plant boot camp. So this is meant to help you with determining what your invasive species are and how to get them out of your yard. Um, so a lot of fun there. That is an online component on October 18th that'll prep you for the event. And you'll actually get a chance to work side by side with our um, environmental team as they remove uh, some invasives and teach us some tricks of the trade on how to get rid of some common uh, plant. So if you're interested in either of those programs, I can put the links up in just a little bit. I know I went through this at a very rapid pace, but I really appreciate all of your attention, your comments. I hope to see the great seed box exchange take place between Anne and others. Uh, and um, if you uh, are interested, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is right here, mross at longwoodgardens.org. My Instagram's at MSU Matador. Um, with two O's and find out some of the bogs and places that I go to. I try to hike every day um, and I, I really have a strong affinity for our area's Pine Barrens, as well as some of the really cool places that are, that are kind of under, underappreciated in Pennsylvania and the region. So uh, follow us also on social media and I hope to have you all visit us at Longwood Gardens. So thank you all. And uh, I'll take any questions, Jesse, if you wanna have um, you field some questions. Yeah, guys, feel free to unmute yourself and ask Matthew anything, or if you feel more comfortable in the chat, you can do that. Um, we'll give it a, a second or two before we move on in case anybody thinks of anything. Matthew, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I am oh, feverishly wrote everything down, guys. So if you have any <laughs> questions. <laughs> really well done presentation, Matt. Thank you. I hope you guys all had a good time tonight. Um, thanks for, for, for joining me uh, and, and on this wild ride about just about everything you could imagine when it comes to marginal plants. So um, they're, they're, they're a true passion of mine and I hope you guys all find your, um, your opportunities to go and visit them in the wild because uh, it really is beneficial. Um, I'll, I'll let Jesse know when I speak to the Smithsonian crowd because um, you'll see a lot of stuff from our area in there as well. And really trying to stress the importance of getting outside. Don't just read about them in books, go out and see them in their natural habitat. Um, you know, read the books too, but it's also really very helpful 
especially those of you that work in the industry to see these plants in the wild and see how they interact mm -hmm. and how you can have that affect um, your, your landscaping style in a very positive way. And I think um, the more we learn when we go out into natural habitats, we can identify the community, but also if there are invasives encroaching, we can at least tell the difference and not that everything we find out there is the way it's supposed to be. And, and to answer your question, I grew up in um, Metro Detroit. We have what we like to call blue clay because it's relatively anaerobic and extremely thick clay. And dogwoods do fantastic in my parents' yard, as do button bush. Um, and we have a, uh, um, a really nice uh, river birch out in their property as well that have been there for you know, the last 20 years or so. Um, dogwoods, you do have to watch out just to make sure that there's airflow. Otherwise, in really wet situations, they can get fungus. And the fungus seems to be more prevalent. This is totally 100% um, uh, anecdotal. I don't have the science to back it, but I can tell you that I've treated a lot more of the variegated ivory halo dogwoods and some of the more elegantissimas for fungus than I have straight species. So it seems like they're a little bit less um, strong, which makes sense too. Um, yep. All right, guys, thank you so much. If the storm really get overwhelmed, it can. Um, and it, you, you can fight it um, uh, if, if you, you know, stay vigilant on it. It's not just plant this plant and it will outcompete it. It is plant this plant and then go after the buckthorn so that it can choke it out eventually or establish it to a point where that buckthorn just realizes this isn't the best spot for me. And my seedlings probably aren't gonna do very well here um, and you, you win the battle. Um, it, it's not an easy one. It's not one that you're gonna you know, overcome in a single year or just by planting one plant is like the magic bullet. And Donna, it's Kenilworth National Park. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. If there are no other questions for Matthew, we are going to move on to a couple of upcoming events and opportunities. Perfect. We have, um, it is the month of September. So if you make your way to Edge of the Woods Nursery, you get a 10% discount by showing your membership card, which you can download from the website. Um, if you have not been there, I highly recommend it. It's an amazing nursery. They're doing um, a lot of great things and they have a lot of variety, a lot of straight species to choose from. And they have it organized very well so that you can pick um, plant communities like Matthew talked about and really put things together that want to thrive in the growing conditions that you have. We have uh, tabling events coming up this weekend. I will be at the Philly Honey Fest representing Wild Ones and talking to the greater Philadelphia area about putting more native plants in all of their spaces big and large in Philly. Um, I will be there tomorrow night five to nine. We, I'm very thankful and fortunate that we have two members that are going to mm -hmm. take the Saturday uh, table at the Wick House because I have to work and um, there's a native plant sale that's happening at that same time there at that same site. So I'm hoping that we can teach about the benefits of natives and then people can go over and actually purchase some. So that's really exciting. And then on Sunday, I will be at the table again at Bartram's Garden. If you can't attend the tabling event, you could still come out and enjoy the festival for a little while. Uh, it's a great time. There's a lot of um, honeybee education, live demonstrations, and lots of honey sampling. And if you're not familiar, the non-native honeybee um, is a, a wonderful, interesting superorganism, and the honey from each hive can be a little bit different. Uh, so it's fun to taste the differences if you've never been to a honey festival before. 
bee beard. Oh, and my husband reminded me there's a, there's going to be a bee beard, um, which is always fascinating to see somebody with honeybees all over their face. Uh, this is an interesting upcoming opportunity in the next few days. Doug Tallamy is speaking at Westchester University. Registration is required, uh, but go check out anytime you get a chance to see Doug speak is a, just an amazing opportunity. So check that out. Uh, registration for that is required. This is a landscape conference um, based on native plants. I attended last year, it was virtual and it was really amazing. Uh, this year they're having it virtual and in person. It is somewhere in the Midwest if you're going in person. So uh, I'm not doing that obviously, but I may attend the virtual event. Uh, they had just lots and lots of presenters and speakers with applicable information for both the personal use and if you have any type of a landscape business. Um, it was a lot of, uh, uh, mingling opportunities to kind of network and, and discuss different topics. And they also had fun things built into their virtual conference, um, like finding secret prizes and stuff. So I, I won a book that I was really, uh, I haven't gotten to read yet, but it's only been a year. So at some point I will get to that. Um, Matthew had mentioned earlier, but Wild Ones is hosting a uh, webinar by Heather Holm, who's an, who is amazing and has done tons and tons of research on um, native bees and wasps. And her new book that's pictured here is fabulous. I take it out almost daily to try and identify different uh, wasps that I find in my backyard and I just love them so much. I highly recommend this book and anything that she presents. It's always wonderful. And maybe some of you probably already know this and I'm just late to the game, but I noticed on our Wild Ones website that there is an opportunity to certify your butterfly garden. And if you already had it certified, you could um, do the application under the pre-certification process. And uh, I was very excited to do that and receive another cue to care to place in my property so that when I'm giving my garden tours, uh, it explains just a little bit about why I'm doing this, what we're doing. Um, so that's a fun thing to look for. And if you're like me and like to collect signs like this, um, it's another opportunity. For our next upcoming meetings, we're gonna have Dan Berenger of Natural Lands give us an identifying and controlling invasives presentation. I really hope that you can attend that and we can get a good head start on fall cleanup and um, tackling spring invasives. Um, so Dan's going to teach us all about that. In November, we're going to discuss dividing. And in December, like Audrey talked about in the beginning, we're going to talk about winter seed sowing and the options for that. And just as a last little reminder, because I'm seeing them so prevalently right now, I wanted to remind everybody that we do have a native praying mantis and she looks like the praying mantis on the left. Um, she's smaller and she's speckly and she has goofy eyes on the side of her head and she looks just friendly and lovable. Uh, and then we have a non-native praying mantis that's much larger and looks vicious. Uh, and as long as we continue to let the, the non-native mantises on the right live, we're gonna have less of our native mantises because the non-natives emerge sooner and they grow bigger and they eat a disproportionate amount of our beneficial insects. Um, we, we're just not gonna have as many native insects, native- Jesse, and real native quick, Jesse, your screen, your screen's not being shared. 
Hmm. Let me see. It how hasn't you... been shared since Matt stopped talking, actually. And I didn't want to say anything because I said it last time when it was me, but this time it's not me. <laughs> well, it looks like, let me see here what, what came up. Yes. Well, there you're back to that one. Uh, let's do this. Okay. Can, can you see it now? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. So um, now, now we're going to match a picture with all that text. Uh, the native mantis is on the left and the non-native mantis is on the right. And as long as we um, continue to let that non-native mantis go in our properties, um, we're going to see less and less of the native mantis. So the middle panel shows you the different uthikas, which is their egg sacs. Um, I have taken to collecting these um, circular spheres that are the non-native Chinese mantis egg sacs and I um, microwave them for an, a minute and that makes any life inside non-viable. Uh, I'm not an expert so I tend not to do anything with the other uthikas that I see here because I'm, I just don't want to risk um, injuring the, the native uthikas. Uh, but you can see there are distinct differences, especially from the Chinese mantis, which is the one that is the biggest and most voracious. Um, so I have no problems culling those. And over the last couple of years, I've even taken to culling the actual um, live insect, which makes me nauseous and I feel bad, but uh, it needs to be done because it's just like an invasive plant, it just doesn't belong here and it's doing more damage than good. So I wanted to give that reminder. Let me just go back in the slides a little bit, make sure there wasn't anything else. Uh, it was a picture of our meetings. Uh, that's the sign that I talked about and the application process on the Wild Ones website. Can you go back to the meetings? Um, yep, hold on one second. Um, this is the Wasp book by Heather Holm. It's a beautiful hardcover book full of pictures. Uh, the Planet Native Conference uh, and Doug Tallamy's um, presentation that's happening. I think that's the last one. Oh, and the Honeybee Festival and Wild Ones. Okay, so yes, let me get you to the picture of the, there, these are our meetings that are left for this year. Thank you. Oh, sure. The um, Judy, are you done with this slide? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. So um, another distinguishing, distinguishing characteristic between the native praying mantis and the non-native Chinese mantises is um, their overall size, but also their wing length. So the Carolina mantis wings are shorter than the body. So it gives a very tapered look to their abdomen. Uh, whereas the Chinese mantis wings are as long as the body. So it looks very tubular. Um, it takes some practice seeing them. And there are so many people who have never seen a native mantis and thought that the Chinese mantis was the only mantis that is around. Uh, and I hear all the time, well, you can't kill a mantis, they're protected by the law, which is not true. Um, there's no punishment for eradicating a non-native species. Um, just, you know, know which one's which so that you're not injuring the natives by accident. So I am, oh, and yes, the uh, Chinese mantis is big enough to eat hummingbirds. And there's been sadly photographic and video evidence of that. So 
yeah, they're bad guys here. They're bad guys here. They don't mean to be, they just are. Um, I'm going to check the chat, see if there's anything. Um, I have tried to feed mantises to my chickens and they will not eat mine. Um, I have, my chickens are chickens. They won't eat, they won't eat spotted lanternflies and they won't eat praying mantises. Um, I, at first tried to give them the Uthikas to see what they would do with that. And they did nothing with that either. So I think they're just spoiled girls and don't go after anything. Um, but the Chinese mantis can draw blood. Um, my husband, like it pinched him significantly enough to break his skin. So yeah, that was after decapitating him. So yeah, they, they're, they're vicious. Uh, it wasn't even full size. I am glad that your chickens will eat lantern flies. That is amazing. I need to get your chickens. Mine will not. Although I'm thinking they might be killing rats, so they're pretty good at that. Um, but if anybody has anything else they want to talk about, feel free. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I think, and then I can see your faces again. Um, if there's any questions you have or anything that you're doing in your garden right now that you're really excited about or um, anything, just let me know. Uh, Jesse, it's yeah. Susan. Um, maybe we should just let the members know anyone who ordered plants from the North Creek plant sale, they are being delivered on Monday and you will be able to pick them up at Jesse's house um, later in the week. Everyone who ordered will get an email. So get your planting spots ready because your plants are about to arrive. Mm -hmm. Which is very exciting. Yeah. So excited. So this is Judy again. Um, I saw a picture, we had the pictures of the various Uthikas and somebody had posted um, a picture of what they said was a native mantis comparing it to the, the Chinese mantis. And they had also shown uh, an Uthika that looked like the European one and said it was the native one where yours shows the, the whitish colored stripe much more defined on the Carolina than this picture did. So I don't know if the, the thing on Facebook was wrong or if they really do look similar enough that they're that hard to tell apart other than the big round one, of course, which is obviously very different. Yeah, they do look very similar. And because as I said, I'm not an expert, I can tell the Chinese for sure because it is distinct. Um, I don't, injure other Uthikas because I just don't want to take the chance. Uh, while the European and the other um, mantis are not native, they are not as detrimental uh, because they do not grow as large. And so they don't have the chance to outcompete our natives as much. So um, that's why I focus my eradication on the larger Chinese mantis. Uh, I just saw, let's see. Heather just put in the chat, um, she was collaborating with Gardening Know How on a video series regarding the fall migration, what to plant to attract and support migrating monarchs and birds. You can follow it on YouTube. Um, her channel is the Garden Thoughtfully or the sponsor gardening know-how. I think I came across that on Facebook today, Heather, and I didn't get a chance to look at it, but uh, that will be really interesting for us. If you can maybe send us a link, we could put that in our meeting highlights. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, Zach. Hi, my name is Zach. I'm a new member. Um, yeah, I, I, I got some comments and things. I, I'm planting four trees this weekend, uh, four pawpaw um, cultivars, like th th three different cultivars, and one white oak. Um, and um, so I'm looking forward to that, but I have to, I have to find and buy a, a tree, uh, not fence, structure, um, protector, whatever. Um, yeah. So I got that going on. That's awesome, Zach. Um, Susan knows all about protecting her baby trees. Maybe she mm. can give you some um, 
words of wisdom about what would be the best caging material for your new trees. Right. And Zach, I actually have a lot of extra tree tubes. If you oh, would yeah. like some, why don't you email me? It's the secretary at Wild Ones email and let me know what size you need and maybe we can connect somehow. Yeah, what town are you in? Um, I'm in the middle of Montgomery County. Oh, okay. okay. Where are you? Oh, okay. I'm in Malvern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me know what you might need and I'm happy to help. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I got that going on. And then um, I'm, I, I'm new to natives uh, since March. That's when I got into it. Um, my, my local land trust came out with like a flyer on, uh, on, on um, wildflowers. And then I learned the why in it. And then I kind of got hooked on it. Um, and now I'm stuck. Now I'm deep in, deep in it. And I'm a data guy. So I've been looking at the lookup tools online. There's one that Tom, um, that, that no, Doug um, promotes a bit. That's the native uh, lookup tool beta. That one's, that one's cool. Cause you, it, you, it ranks. Yeah, that's it. It's cool. Cause it kind of ranks how many different species it attracts, but it's not quite so cool. It, it, I can't filter by the, uh, the soil condition and the light needs, and there's not many pictures. Then I found this amazing um, database called the ERA highway something database. And this guy, Mark Skinner built it. And then um, long story, very short. I, I, I have a team of four people with code for Philly, which is like a service group. And we're making like a lookup um, what app for Pennsylvania based on that amazing database. And the guy who made the database, his name's Mark Skinner. He, he's happy because his, his database, like it ended up being a map. I could show you guys real quick. And he's not happy that it never was like, had pictures and enrichment like that. Um, so yeah, we're working on that. And Code for Philly is like a service oriented coder group where they'll, they'll make something like a bike a place to park your bike in a, in a city, like things that are good for society, but not commercially viable, you know? Um, let me, let me show you guys what, what data set I'm talking about here. Uh, cause it's a great data set, but it's not very, um, pr pretty it's for, I, I, like the highway commission paid for it. So it's more so like, I guess, uh, helping those type of people. So it's this data set and then this, this very, very large data set um, is 1600 plants for Pennsylvania. So this is our data set, but we're making it so that it's more like an app uh, where, where you filter for what you want and you seek pictures. And then I'm trying to stick, figure out how can I drive people to native nurseries? That's the other puzzle I'm trying to solve. Zach, um, Audubon, Audubon has uh, you put in a zip code. I know, I, li I like that too but I can't filter by the soil conditions and the light conditions. I thought it did, but maybe I'm yeah. thinking of another one, but I, if I, I, like, I remember what it is, I'll let you know. I, yeah, I like that one a lot. Um, <laughs> the one I like the most, it's like beeline, but, but unfortunately it's UK. And this is, uh, where is it? Plant, let me say plant finder. I, I wanna kind of show you guys what, uh, no, it's bee kind. Well, anyway, I found this be kind plant lookup and I'm like, oh my God, this is it. This is what I'm envisioning in my mind. Uh, but, but it's for uh, the UK, you know? Uh, um, but this is like the vision of it. It would look a lot like this where you just quickly are able to filter for the soil and the light and then little pictures pop up. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower uh, Center also has- that Yeah, that's good too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I like Autobahn too. Zach, the thing about soil and light is that it's so variable. I mean, you may have clay, oh, yeah. I may have clay, but our clays are really different. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so what I do is if I find a plant that I think I'm interested in, I go mm. and look it up on like seven different websites. And I, yeah. I see how many times they say, 
it needs a certain kind of light or a certain kind of soil. And I sort of filter in my brain from that. I don't know how you put that in a data, you know, how you quantify that because so much of it is, you know, I've seen some websites where they say one plant likes um, alkaline soil and another website says the plant requires acid soil. So at that point, you know, what do you do? You need some experience or, you know, it, it depends on which website you're using. You know, Missouri Botanical is one that you might trust and others might not be as, I mean, it's really subjective at that point. That's a tough one. That's a yeah. big challenge that yourself. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, Mark, Mark is the guy who made the database. So the database is done. We're just trying to make like a, a modern UI of it, a modern app for it. Mark made a really good point where it's just like blooming times. Well, if, 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 if it's native to Canada all the way down to Florida, that's, that record's not gonna be true yeah. for, for the whole world. So you're totally right. There's a caveat to the data that, that, that they maintained. Very subjective, um, but still. Yeah. Zach, I'm, che I'm checking out your UI on Tableau Public right now. This is, oh, no, this that, is amazing. Oh, well, no, that, that was actually, the prototype that got real coders into it. Um, okay. The real it, the real coders will be in, um, in, in in like JavaScript or like a real app. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, that's like a prototype to get people interested. Um, oh, very cool. Maybe, that's that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I got that going on. Um, so Zach, so you're you're not only planting trees, but you're going to help the rest of us plant the right trees sometime in the near future. I love more tools to do that. Yeah, you. Well, my audience is not us, but no. our neighbors. Where I say, hey, just just click click a couple of filters, and th it sorts by the ones that are available locally and and very high pollinator value, and then it like kind of shortlists it for them. Um, that's my goal to yeah. f facilitate that conversation. And it starts them simple. And as soon as they see, you know, those first bees or birds. They, oh, right. They're hooked. My, that, that's what happened with my wife. She was like, uh, then when she saw a monarch butterfly from the milkweed, she was like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, then, she, then she was hooked with me. Yeah. You know what, these events that Jesse's doing in the fall, the tabling events, if you had that app on a tablet and you yeah, just that'd be hand badass. the tablet over to a visitor to the table and said, here, put in the conditions in your front yard and see what you get. You'd yeah. really get them, like you said, hooked. hooked. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, that could work really well. If you guys can still see my screen, this is the design. Oh. Like we're designing it before we code it. But, you know, it's That's like, really nice. it, so it's mobile, mobile first. Where it's kind of like this, so you you there's this not where to short start answer five questions. So you answer five questions on your soil, and and Roxanne is one of the UI people. She's in it right now. Um, you you answer questions about your soil and the light, and what your goals are, and then that that puts the filters on. Then these are these little chips, and you can take them off if you want, and then um and then you can favorite, and that's about it. What, what, what I'm cool. racking my pretty brain cool. on. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Very accessible. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. We, we can all feed into that, you know, if you want from experience so that the right plants pop up. Yeah, so what where, where I could use you guys help one, one day is like, here's the data from Mark and it's the plant type, uh, pollinator value, the, the soil moisture. So we're, we're presenting all of that. But then if I want an um, often recommended flag or a super plant flag, there's a little bit of judgment there. And my criteria is right now is, is Longwood Gardens recommending it and my local conservation and it's locally available. Well, that, that will make a yes. But the yes is debatable over time. And then- right. um, And the more people who plant it and have experience with it, the more uh -huh. they can- into whether it's really easy to grow does it really tolerate clay can it really handle yeah. full sun, stuff like that we could yeah i mean this whole group can help with that because you've got so much experience here right right that, that's really exciting that sounds really cool then then not version one but version two we were thinking some kind of like comment feature where you you, you can comment on that plant or upvote it something 
Yeah, um, right. And there's this website, it's like Dave's Garden or something, where oh, Kana yeah, has yeah. some of that. And, and, and it's an ancient looking website, but why is it yeah. so popular? Maybe maybe because of that social feel where you can upvote or comment on things. So um, that's not re revision one. We've got to go iterative, but yeah. we look to all these sites for inspiration and we don't want to build something that exists. That's the other thing, so. Right, like you can do better than Dave's Garden. Right, because right. Dave's Garden, you have no idea how much experience these people actually have. Oh. <laughs> right, so. Maybe, yeah, yeah, you, you, you raise a good point. Be Your Advocate has re re reviews from the bros, the people who are the pros at drinking beer than the regular people. Oh, same yeah, with right. same with the movie critics. It's the critic score and the everyone else score. Maybe there's both. Who knows? Oh wow! Yeah. Maybe we have a wild one score. Oh, wild one score. Yeah. Right. Like the the group would decide how we want to score plants, and then we'll we'll put that on if you want. Oh, uh, so funny. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. depends on where the plant's growing too. I mean, you oh. know, our our score might be. Um, because in my yard it grows, but in your yard it doesn't. That kind of. Mm. Thing. Mm. I think we'd have to score it by conditions. Like if you want a plant that's really easy to grow, that would grow in a lot of different conditions. Right. Then we would score right. it easy. Because yeah. We would all agree. Oh yeah, that guy grows everywhere. Right. You know, like like the the corn uh, mm. uh, coneflower maximus. That thing will grow in the front yard. You know, on, mm. the, on the sidewalk. So that gets an easy. And then we tried to pick a name where we could by the dot com and the dot com was available and we ended up picking only plant natives dot com and i also got only plant native dot com for the typo um and and you know i i, I thought maybe there could be that's controversial to say that but it's kind of like zero waste like you're not really zero waste it's not a commit it's not a commandment it's a focus and goal or like even even like vegan no, no, no you, you, not everyone can be totally vegan if you're diabetic and you need insulin and that comes from an animal. So it's just like only plant native. I think that's okay to say like so blunt, bluntly um, when, it, when it could be a goal, not a commandment. I don't know. So only for this website, people can still choose other things, but this website focuses on natives. And that's right. Can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Zach, I have to take off, but I just want oh, to yeah. know the public horticultural world, like the public gardens world, we have massive databases that you might be interested in collaborating with. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Hmm. And also professionals, if you need, if you need people for, for, um, you know, uh, one of the things that Susan mentioned is Dave's garden is not always credible because anybody could say anything they want. And there's, there is some good information in there, but there's also yeah. some some that's not necessarily well respected viewpoints by those that have large and extensive backgrounds in horticulture. But, yeah. But you're fortunate that you're launching this in the greater Philadelphia area because Philadelphia has the largest mm. collection of public gardens anywhere in the country. Mm. And you have several of them that are focused solely on native plants, like Stonely and Mount Cuba. Right, right. Yeah. So happy to connect you if, if, if you ever need it. Um, one final thing. I, I know I'm, I'm going so much, but it, but I think this is really interesting. I I I started growing from seed, and I got sun drops from Ernst. And Ernst, you have to buy at least an ounce. So I got an ounce of seeds, and then and then I I I bought um, cone peeners, they're called. And there's these, it's these little seven inch long cells, and I I planted them, and it worked great. And and the 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 roots go all the way down and fill the whole container. And then when I put them as plugs, they, they actually bloom this year. Um, it, which, which, yeah, Ernst was like, how did you make them bloom so fast? Then I had so much, like uh, too, too, too much seeds that I, I just posted on Facebook and said, who wants the seeds? And then I sent them those seeds, uh, like a half a gram uh, or a gram packet. Um, cause it, yeah. So, do you so not maybe have deer? what's that? Do you not have deer. They eat sun drops. Oh, do they? I didn't know that. Um, well, if they didn't eat them, then you don't have them. Well, <laughs> well I actually don't have, I don't have deer in my area, so I'm okay. 
and, good. and I re I've read that sun drops has high salt tolerance so I have it near near my uh road okay, so, so hoping sun, it will serve sun it. drops or seed box no su sun drops oh, okay. um fruticasta the whatever fruticosa yeah the perennial not the biennial yeah the deer have stayed away from mine sort of mm. so um i think it depends on your deer right well and zach has them by the road and the deer are more wary right. of right, road right. Size. yeah so, yeah very i actually have never seen a deer yeah oh and the I, newest the newest thing is that white is 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 a warning sign for deer so they, they're now painting road uh a road stakes white to keep the deer off the highway oh. so try i mean let's try whatever oh, i'm yeah, I like put, that i'm trying to put bayberry uh twigs around my plants to see if the deer will stay from away from them it, it's all an experiment yeah, right up next to my bayberry plant and ate something so i don't think that would stop them <laughs> okay okay no, i so have i have hidden I have hidden sun drops under something else, like under a beauty under berry, something. and it worked. They mm. ate the sun drop that was exposed and they left the other one alone. So it's very variable, <laughs> very subjective. Right. I'd been on a field trip with a botanist in Delaware, and he said the secret to overcoming the deer browse is to plant every square inch because they right. can't possibly eat it all. So if you just keep planting, uh, and I had him get that in writing for all of our spouses so that they know the professionals say we have to plant every square inch so that we can overcome deer brows. We have to buy more plants. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly, I'm with it. <laughs> Zach, I'm really excited to see what you have coming, especially since um, you've only been at this six months. So yeah. uh, after you tackle the whole get everybody to be able to sort and filter for their yeah. best native plants, I want you to tackle how we get people to stop putting in invasives. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think you can do it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> There's a lot of things. There are people like, oh, what plants go together? I'm like, all right, now you're really making the data complex. Uh, but it, it's it's theoretically possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's important to plant in communities. Mm, I know. Way. So yeah, I mean, that that's definitely next level kind of things. But um, yeah, that's yeah. exciting. That makes a lot of sense. And there's a book out there, and I'm not going to remember, maybe I can look up which one it is, that actually every time they list a plant, they list the community where the mm. plant thrives. So the plant, it's so it's a plant with, you know, yeah. plant Ilex bursalata with, then they have five other plants, okay. which I found really helpful because if I don't know what Ilex vert likes, I might recognize the soil and light conditions of those other plants and thinks, oh, that's what my Ilex needs. So now I've learned something about where Ilex likes to live. There are a lot of, if you look in field guides, they do that often. They, they kind of keep the communities together, but also that book, the um, essential native plant trees and shrubs of the East lists kind of communities also. So that's a, a good resource for that. The one, because I think it's one that you um, recommended and I went and got from the library. So the that might be the one. Yeah. I think we need a, um, a list of resources on the website. Um, Zach, maybe you're the inspiration. I don't know if you want to work on that, but I've been trying to post stuff on the website and there's not a whole lot there yet. But um, oh, like start. the heavy hitters. Yeah, I could oh, tell you. OK, great, great. If you can yeah. email me, let, let's collaborate. I'd love some input on what else needs to go up on the website. Yeah. There's one TED talk that I think is great because he he starts not with bugs. He says, do you guys like birds? And then he goes from there. And I, I think that's a good spin. When I was at the uh, horse show over the weekend, our catchphrase to get people in was, hey, do you know you can grow butterflies? And oh. people oh. would come over and they were like, what are you talking about? And oh. um, so, yeah, it's those little, sometimes plants just aren't people's thing. But yeah, you yeah. find their thing and you can get them hooked. Because eventually their thing does become the plants because they mm. know that's what, 
what gets them the other thing that they want. Yeah. Zach, how did you become hooked? I, I, I didn't like the idea of, of planting just for aesthetics and it drove me nuts. So I, 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 I it was like indecision because it's like, what am I getting out of this? Right. It, am I getting food? Like, no, like, like plants in your front yard. It's like, I'm not going to do, do a garden there. And then when I had a reason for it and, and I see a lot of development and none of my neighbors plant native plants. So it's like there, it is a more and more of a food desert and I am a landowner and I have half an acre and I can do something. And it, it, I, I go and check on my seedlings every morning and spray them. And it's, and I think that's very mentally good for you. I have an older neighbor, uh, Becky, we always talk about plants. It's something we really connect with. I took her to the flower show. I know that made her weak, you know? <laughs> so there's little things like that, that are, are nice. I like, I, I compost it just to the sake of composting. Now I'm actually using compost. So, um, yeah, it, I, it's a, it's, it's, it's a hobby that keeps giving like, like cooking. You learn to cook, it's a hobby that keeps giving. Gardening is the same thing. You said your land trust sent a flyer around. Yeah, it's awesome. What is that? Um, the, the, the Willis Town Willis Conservation Town, okay. Trust. Yeah. Yeah, see, so that kind of thing. Maybe, Jesse, we can work with local land trusts to provide them with Wild Ones literature or contribute, you know, information to what they send around. Yeah. Do you know, did Willis Town email everybody in, the, in, in West Vincent Township or... No, I don't, I, I don't think so. I think it's just the members. I can ask them. I'll ask them. I mean, do you, go to, the, says, do you go to the bird banding at Willistown, Zach? No, I don't know about that. Pretty cool. It's oh, okay. You have to be there early in the morning, though. Hmm. Like you said, Zach, preaching to the choir is one thing, but we want to preach to the neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, that's why I asked you how you got hooked, because I think that's the mm. biggest thing is how to get people interested because we all yeah. we do end up talking to the choir but um yeah right well zach a good way to do that is to replant your front yard yeah you know take yeah. out the grass and people are going to notice I, so many people at my daughter's house where she's in a village and everybody walks by and they're always asking what did you plant here they look i leave the tags and they look at the tags and I'm, hopefully they're learning that would yeah. be a great way to reach your neighbors I kind of pitch to their emotions because some guys, they just don't want to think about it. I'm like, oh, these are native plants. They're built for this. They don't need fertilizer. And they're like, oh. But I, it depends on the audience. Fertilizing and mowing, that's a guy thing, yes? Yeah. And then, and then there's, um, yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of different angles. Kids that's like really it, smart. you know, whatever. I never thought about that. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so we should work together on this website thing. We'll get some more stuff up there. Yeah. And then we figure out how to drive people to it. Yeah, I'll, t I'll, I'll, I'll send you my top links because I, I read so much, you know. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's I'm awesome, heading guys. out, guys. I'll be, right. I'll be back in town in a couple of weeks. All right, it's great to see you. We'll see you again soon. Yep, take care. Bye-bye. everybody. All right, guys, um, I'm going to call it a night, too. If anybody um, needs anything, reach out. If you want to come to the Honey Fest, check it out. Um, otherwise, we will be in touch again next month. Jesse, can you send me your slides so I can do the meeting update and get all that? I will share right it with you right when I get off here. That's great. And then the meeting highlights will be on the website in the next couple of days. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Oh, yep. Bye bye. Good night, guys. Care about Link.